Okay, I'd like to call to order the uh, regular meeting of the Quincy School Committee of Wednesday, April 5th. Uh, would you please stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance? Please remain standing for a moment of silence and in your thoughts. Please uh, keep in your mind the safety and well-being of our students and staff and also those that protect us both locally and around the world. Thank you. Superintendent, please call the roll. Gayhill, Mr. Gatro, Mrs. Hubley, Mrs. Lebo, Mrs. Santoro, Present. and Mayor Koch. Present. Okay, at this time, I'd like to read the following. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Okay, I'll take a motion to approve the regular meeting uh, minutes of March 22nd. On a motion of Mrs. Hubley, seconded by Mrs. Lebo, on the motion. Yes, I'd like to amend the minutes of the regular meeting. During the presentation that Ms. Stroud is making about the food waste, um, food diversion project, there was an error in some of the names. And so I just want to change the wording on this. The members of the group supporting the food waste diversion program are Ruth Davis, Shelley Dean, Sarah Dufour, Finn by Hill, Slip, Tom Henry, and Emily Lebo. And Ms. Owens has a correction. Okay. Okay, on the motion with the uh, recommended uh, amendments, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Also, I'll take a motion to approve the executive session minutes of March 22nd. Motion of Mrs. Lebo, seconded by Mr. Bergoli. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And the ayes have it. At this time, we uh, will go to item two, which is the open forum. This is an opportunity for community input regarding the Quincy Public Schools community and in this context, the community is defined as a resident of the city, a parent of a student who attends QPS, or an employee of QPS. Non-community people may uh, permitted are permitted are not permitted to speak at open forum, but they can submit written statements to the school committee. After giving uh, your name and address, each speaker may make a presentation of no more than four minutes to the school committee and an individual may not exchange their time or yield to others. Is there anybody for open forum? Please come forward to the mic. Name and address, please. Um, Angela Chen, and my address is 31 <coughs> Densmore Street. So, hello, members of the school committee, teachers, parents, and students. I am Angela Chen, and today I am here as president of North Quincy High School's Asian Culture Club to call for the official recognition of Lunar New Year as a city holiday for Quincy. This topic has been previously addressed and brought up by several staff from previous years with notable ones from our school's guidance counselor, Ms. Shaw, and from the department head of math, Mr. Caldwell. They have made attempts to recognize the holiday by sending letters, but have failed. As an Asian American student attending North Quincy High School, where the population of the student body consists of 55% Asians. Not having Lunar New Year off is simply mind-boggling to me. Um, to the Chinese and other Asian populations, Lunar New Year is a very, if not the most important, holiday in our cultures. Uh, this is why recognizing Lunar New Year as an official city holiday is a must. Me and my team members here with me today have worked hard for the past month by getting advice from teachers, garnering an abundance of student support, through spreading our petition and researching the facts and statistics surrounding this holiday. Now, the rest of my teammates will go more in depth about the importance of Lunar New Year to many cultures, the widespread support of the Quincy community for this change, and the real actions, the real actions that should be taken by the school committee. I hope each of the school committee members carefully listen to our argument and take appropriate action. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jasmine Chen. I live on 59 East Elm Avenue, Quincy, Massachusetts, 02.170. I am also a current junior attending North Quincy High School. 
North Quincy High School embraces more than 55% of students who are of Asian descent. Quincy Public Schools as a whole has a 40% Asian American student population whose families celebrate Lunar New Year. The district should consider this day as a district holiday for these reasons. Lunar New Year is a major holiday celebrated in many East Asian countries, including China, Taiwan, Vietnam, Singapore, and South Korea. Today, Lunar New Year is a special time to bring friends and family together for feasting and lively festivities to carry on the legacy that immigrants of Asian descent have fortunately carried to the US um, and various parts of the world decades ago. Depending on the custom of the region, this holiday can last up for as long as 15 days. While in the US we do not have such luxury, many Asian American students and staff members typically would take a single day off on Lunar New Year's Day. The next Lunar New Year will be on Saturday, February 10th, 2024, and we anticipate that many students and even staff members will take the day off. With nearly half the school's student body out of school, teachers may not want to teach new materials on this day, or they may need to plan on teaching the same lessons twice. A day off would allow a favorable compromise on behalf of both the students and the staff. And on the, on the other hand, recognizing Lunar New Year as a district holiday depicts the fact that QPS as a city acknowledges diversity and embraces inclusion of the Asian American students and their families' cultures. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Nicole Chen and I live on 66 Cliff Street and I'm a junior on the Student Council of North Quincy High School. Today, I will be presenting evidence of the widespread support of this change from the community. Again, to reiterate, Mr. Codwell has previously sent a letter to the school committee regarding this issue. Although the school calendar did not implement the change, many school committee members were supportive of the idea. I will now read some of the replies of certain committee members to Mr. Codwell's request. Number one, from Mr. Frank Santero, said, quote, I'm with you, Kip. We will still have to be open 180 days. We will need to add a day to our calendar, end quote. Next, Ms. Emily Lebo said, quote, Kip, thank you. We should consider this for next year, end quote. And following that, Mr. Doe Gertro said, quote, thanks for the note, certainly worth considering for next year since the calendar is established for the 2021-2022 school year, end quote. In addition to support from many of the committee leaders, many people have opted to sign a petition. Getting an overwhelming 543 signatures, it is clear that this motion is widely supported by the general population of both North Quincy and Quincy High School. One more thing I would like to add. Last year, the city of Boston officially recognized and passed Lunar New Year as a day off despite having a substantially lower Asian population proportionally. Quincy is purpose, perfectly capable of doing the same. As we approach the time to vote on the new amendments to the upcoming Quincy Public School calendar, we as a community urge to have Lunar New Year recognized as a district holiday and thus have an official day off of the QPS school calendar year. Therefore, next Lunar New Year, which lands on Saturday, February 10th, should translate to a day off of that Monday, that following Monday, February 12th. For the days in which Lunar New Year does not fall on a school day, the following school day should be taken off. We also recognize that if this holiday gets passed, one more school day will be added to the end of the school day. Not only have we raised support within North Quincy High School, hundreds of community members have voiced their support and endorsed the amendment through the petition our team has created. With a staggering 55% of students of Asian descent at North, it is unacceptable that we do not have a designated day to celebrate such a significant holiday with family and friends. This day of school is actively hurting the community. Instead, it will be more worthwhile to have a majority of the student body in school on that added day at the end of the year, rather than having a school day where everyone is out on a major cultural holiday. Furthermore, this official district holiday will serve as a time for others to learn and celebrate such a valuable holiday and allow the district to represent their diversity and inclusion. We urge you to take this into consideration while planning the new Quincy Public School school year calendar and thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Susan Chinson. I live at 21 Linden Street in Wollaston. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak to the city, uh, the school council meeting. Um, this is my first time attending any such type of, or and wanting to speak, so apologies for my sort of, just impr impromptuness of all of this. I just heard about tonight's meeting this afternoon and this was the only night I was actually able to make it this whole week, so I feel like it's meant to be. Um, it's wonderful getting to hear these students um, advocate for um, the day off for Lunar New Year. Um, as a resident of Quincy for almost 20 years, I am raising uh, my two children who are currently at Atlantic Middle School um, here, and it was a decision that my spouse and I made to live in Quincy because we wanted to live in a community 
where there were other people who had similar values and experiences that we had and that our children would also have as well. Um, with the growing number of the Asian American community here in uh, Quincy, we really hope that you would also consider um, considering the day off, um, following other cities in the state of Massachusetts, including Hopkinton, Wayland, Brookline, and Boston. Um, Quincy certainly is a place where um, the, has been an anchor for the Asian American community. Um, as, a, as a board member of South Cove Community Health Center, also um, a former managing director of the Chinese Historical Society of New England, um, these are, rem are remarks personally of myself, but recognize that these are important issues that um, many don't necessarily know how to advocate for or engage. Um, so I hope as elected officials yourselves that you will consider um, all of these aspects. Um, there are a number of other parents who are also interested in getting this passed and perhaps if you pass this sooner rather than later, it will save us from more like work that we have to do instead of having to pay attention to our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Dear Quincy School Committee could, members. Could you state your name? Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. My name is Grace Young Jay, um, resident of Quincy. Give me my address. Okay, uh, Six Florence Street in Quincy. Um, Dear Quincy School Committee members, we are writing to request that Lunar New Year be added as a day off for students in our school district. Lunar New Year, also known as Spring Festival, is a holiday celebrated by many Asian and Pacific Islander communities uh, around the world. It is a time for families to come together, celebrate cultural, religious practices, and reflect on the past year. We are a group of Quincy stakeholders, residents, parents, community leaders, business owners, and students. With approximately 50% of the students in our school system identifying as being of Asian American Pacific Islander, AAPI, descent, the Quincy school calendar should reflect the population of Quincy families. By recognizing this holiday as a day off and respecting the cultural and religious practices of those who celebrate Lunar New Year, the school committee will demonstrate leadership while also promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, within our school's district. Based on the 2020 census data, Asian American Pacific Islanders represent a majority percentage of the QPS population and community as a whole. We encourage Quincy to show support for AAPI families in QPS and join other cities and towns in Massachusetts like Boston, Brookline, Wayland, and Hoppington that have added to the diversity and inclusion of recognized days off in their districts. Adding Luna New Year as a day off would demonstrate Quincy's commitment to respecting, supporting, and welcoming all students and their families. Recognizing Luna New Year as a day off for students shows that our school district values and respects the diverse cultural backgrounds of our students and their families and celebrates the diverse backgrounds of all students, staff, and the community they serve. This would allow families to fully participate in the celebrations and pass down traditions to younger generations without the interference of academic obligations. It allows students to celebrate their heritage and traditions without having to miss school. And it promotes cultural awareness and understanding among all students and staff. Furthermore, acknowledging Lunar New Year as a school holiday can have positive impacts on AAPI students' academic performance and overall well-being. Research has shown that students who feel connected to their cultural identity are more likely to succeed academically and have better mental health outcomes. Celebrating Lunar New Year as a school community can help AAPI students feel more connected to their cultural heritage and identity which can in turn benefit their academic and emotional well-being. Lastly, we strongly urge the school committee to consider adding Nula New Year as a day off for students in our school's district. Doing so would be an important step towards recognizing Lunar New Year as a school holiday and promoting DEI in Quincy's school district, supporting the AAPI students, 
and their families with the goal of fostering a sense of belonging, inclusivity, and respect for all students. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Is there anybody else for open forum? Last call, open forum. Okay, thank you to our speakers. Superintendent's report, item A, student recognition, Quincy North Quincy Winter Color Guard and Quincy North Quincy Band. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. This is our student recognitions. I want to congratulate uh, the Quincy North Quincy High Color Guard on receiving a bronze medal out of the 10 squads competing in the Scholastic Region A Division at the New England Scholastic Band Association Finals Competition last weekend. The students had their best performance of the year, and we are so proud of their outstanding season and accomplishments. Special congratulations to North Quincy High School senior Jason Lee on receiving the Ed Denon Memorial Scholarship presented by the Massachusetts Scholastic Band Judges Association. So congratulations uh, to Jason Lee and all of the students and staff who helped participate uh, in, in this great event. Quincy Public Schools High School Band students participated in the Massachusetts Instrumental Choral and Conductors Association Concert Band Competition last weekend. Congratulations to the Quincy High, North Quincy High Symphonic Band, which won a civil medal under the leadership of Matthew Cavanaugh in the Quincy, North Quincy High School uh, Wind and Ensemble, who also won a silver medal under the direction of Michael DeMarco. So congratulations to those students, and thank you to our staff who helped um, that happen. Staff recognition. Uh, congratulations to Athletic Director Kevin Mahoney for being recognized by the Massachusetts Secondary School Administrators Association as the 2022-2023 Ted Damco winner for his outstanding contributions to athletics administration at Quincy High School and the Quincy Public School community. So congratulations to our Athletic Director Kevin Mahoney and of course the support of his two principals who are here tonight as well, uh, Dan Gilbert and Keith Ford. Uh, high School Spring Concerts, Quincy High School's concert was held last night and showcased the talents of the Quincy, North Quincy High, Symphonic Band, Wind Ensemble, Select Choir, and Tenor Bass a cappella. In addition, the Quincy High School Junior and Concert Choirs also performed. North Quincy High School's Spring Concert is next Tuesday, April 11th at 7 p.m., featuring the same citywide ensembles in the North Quincy Junior and uh, Concert Choirs. So best of luck uh, to those students and uh, choir and band. On Thursday, April 6th, Quincy High School's career vocational and technical education students enrolled in our engineering design and development class will present their final presentations. Students work as a team to design and construct a solution to an engineering problem, applying principles they have developed in the previous Project Lead the Way courses. This year's projects include better backpacks, smarter safety glasses, hygienic handles, and bike helmet storage. Presentations will begin at 6 p.m. at Quincy High School in the Adams Lecture Hall. Congratulations to Lincoln Hancock student Alexandra Lee, who was selected as one of our four statewide winners of the Massachusetts Safe Routes to Schoolyard Sign Design Contest. Alexandra's design was one of over 500 submitted and features a multilingual design with text in English and Chinese. We will, of course, post the design on the QPS website and social media, and the signs will be distributed statewide later this spring. So it's pretty impressive that all of these signs you'll see across the state. So congratulations uh, to our local winner. Um, season 14 of the WGBH's high school quiz show is underway, and I'm happy to report we have defending champions at North Quincy High School who have already made it through the qualifying round, beating St. Joseph Prep most recently. Next up is Brookline High School on April 15th at 6.30 p.m. And of course, best of luck to the team as they prepare for this impressive competition. And again, uh, thank you to Principal Gilbert for helping to support that team throughout the process this year. Uh, with that, that concludes my superintendent's report. Comments, questions, Mrs. Hubley. Thank you. Just for clarification, um, was the engineering final presentation, was it the time change? Because I have 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, okay. It is. Uh, I'll, I'll verify and email everybody. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Bergoli. I'd like to um, 
all up in the uh, on the band and uh, our music uh, ensembles who have come so far mm -hmm. in a in a short period of time uh, under the leadership of our uh, directors. I mean, it's just it's outstanding uh, what they've done. So uh, yeah. continue continue progress and uh, they're doing a great job. Thank you. Anybody else? I just want to add um, a thank you to uh, all those. I mean, every week we hear student recognition and the many different things that are happening outside our classroom. I just, on Friday, I just happened to be able to go to the Atlantic um, STEM Fair as uh, well as the Central STEM Fair, was able to see Charlie Brown. All the things we offer to our students uh, within the Quincy Public Schools, I just want to say thank you to everybody because we do so many things outside our classroom that benefits our students in every single way. So thank you to all. Thank you, Superintendent. All right, we're moving on to old business. The, yes, Mayor Coke. Can I make a motion we take item Hold on, 5A on. out of order? You're going to find your, uh, oh, say that again, please. Make a motion that we take item 5A out of order so we can hear our young people tonight. Okay, on a motion of Mr. Coke to take item 5A out of order. New business. On a second, second by Mr. Guttrow. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, Ms. Roy, Mr. Ms. Boudreaux, and Ms. Krieger, please. Either of those are Good evening, everyone. I was just reading my agenda, that's all I know. Um, is this working? Mm -hmm. Yep. Good? Okay. So, Mr. Santor, I don't know if, if you're still humming Charlie Brown, but I've been waking up you know, every day for the last week and a half, humming Charlie Brown. So I'm here to represent um, Ms. Boudreau, uh, who is our department head for science at North Quincy High, as well as Marco and Madison, who have done an outstanding job. I don't know if you got to come to our, our, our STEM fair this year, but it was incredible. Um, and if you're a judge, I don't know how you judge. Um, uh, all those pro projects are just amazing. But um, I do want to introduce our, our two students tonight, uh, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Boudreau. Um, just from the entire staff at North, the pride that we have in the things that Superintendent Mulvey read about North, uh, and the students that we have, uh, many of whom could not be here, uh, but the two that are here tonight will impress you, I'm sure, with their projects. Um, good luck understanding actually what they're talking about, but um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do some tutoring later if necessary. So uh, am I turning it over to Mr. Ford or Ms. Boudreaux? Yes. Okay, Ms. Boudreaux. So. inviting us here tonight to recognize and celebrate our outstanding science students. My name is Claire Bidrow. I'm the science department chair at North Quincy High School. North Quincy High School hosted their 64th annual STEM fair on Thursday, February 9th, and we had 120 students present their projects to 55 judges. Students have been working hard since September to research and finalize their projects with the help of their teachers, Dr. Nicole Kamisis, Mr. Patrick Kessler, and Mr. Michael Kucha. From our science fair, we had three winners and seven students who received honorable mention. We had 10 students who advanced to the Region 5 STEM fair at Bridgewater State College on March 4th, and we have six students who will be advancing to the Massachusetts State Fair on May 5th at MIT. Two of our students are excited to present to you tonight. We have Madison Evans, who won third place at the North Quincy STEM Fair, and Marco Mano, who won second place at the Region 5 STEM Fair. We'll start with Madison. is the effect of phosphorus on aquatic life. So I chose to research what um, effects fertilizer runoff has on um, aquatic ecosystems. So that includes animals and algae, which are both very important parts of all aquatic systems. So um, phosphorus is a uh, nutrient that is used as fertilizer to help crops grow. It's inorganic, meaning 
it's not like compost, which could also be used as a fertilizer or like waste from animals. Um, so I simulated phosphorus runoff in two tanks with um, algae algae in both tanks and phosphorus in one tank and distilled water in the other. Since phosphorus is a nutrient, it the algae bloomed more in the tank with the phosphorus, which would um, represent the fertilizer. So um, using ghost shrimp, which are an invertebrate, I added them to both tanks. And I found that in the tank with the fertilizer, they died within a day. Right now, I don't know exactly why they died because there are many reasons and next year I have a thousand dollars to continue my project as a grant from the algae foundation which is actually um, has a curriculum at my school right now um, that we are learning about so um, the algae foundation runs um, algae farms which can be the algae grown in the algae farms can be used as bio oil which can renew non-renewable resources so um, it also can be it dried and used as a way to support, like, almost help world hunger because it can be dried and um, used as food. So um, it's important that stuff like this is researched because algae is um, a really important resource. And the more research we do and the more information we spread, um, the more innovation we'll have in the future. So I chose to do my project on algae and pollution because right now those are very relevant topics and So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Marco Mano. I'm a current freshman at North Quincy High School. So for my project, the specific topic I chose relates to how does deutronopia affect the visibility of optical illusions. Now, deutronopia is the medical term for red-green color blindness. And for the specific optical illusion that I'm referring to in this experiment is the Benham disc, which was made by Charles Benham. So I chose my topic because I have a profound interest in optics, especially genetic mutations that cause the individual to experience certain diseases. Once applying it to university, I plan on majoring in something along these lines. However, I'm still a freshman, so who knows what happens down there. <laughs> uh, I believe that everyone with vision issues will benefit from the data that I collected. So some quick statistics, more than 4.2 million Americans aged 40 years and older are either legally blind, having best corrected visual acuity of six out of 60 in the better seeing eye or with low vision, having best corrected visual acuity less than six out of 12 in the better seeing eye, excluding those who are legally blind. The leading cause of blindness and low vision in the United States are primar primarily age-related eye diseases, such as age-related macular degeneration, cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, and glaucoma. Other common eye disorders include amblyopia and strabismus. So for my project, I had to uncover quite a, few, quite a bit of background research because the eye is generally very complicated and dealing with any project concerning physics does get pretty hazy with every single, for example, source of light affects the data. So I, I observed a few crucial points about how eyesight works, how humans process color, what is colorblindness, and how does colorblindness affect animals or humans as we do classify as animals. So for the data or the methods for this project. So the best disk here was rotated at various speeds or RPM, rotations per minute, or how long or how many times this could rotate around in every single minute. Uh, it was rotated at various speeds of 60 RPM, 120 RPM, 180, 240 RPM, 300, and 360 RPM. Uh, obviously, you need to have a huge range because you have to you know, take out any variables. It was recorded in front of a high-speed 4K camera where the deutronop there was a deutronopia filter on computers where I basically simulated being red-green colorblind 
without using a pay, actual human beings because it wasn't really allowed by the guidelines. They didn't really want me to just, <laughs> <laughs> fortunately, but <laughs> it, it could have been <laughs> way easier. But, <laughs> outside the box and using some programs I was able to find online, like uh, Scratch programs from MIT, the, the color correction RGB color program that you could find on any like Chrome extension app store. And from that, you're able to record each specific color that comes off this disk. Because in actuality, once you spin this at a certain rate, you actually start to see colors. And I tested if someone was regularly colorblind, at which speed would they see the boldest color? So, throughout all the sets of data, it was found that the lowest velocity, 60 RPM, provided the darkest pigment to someone with red-green color blindness. So, for this experiment, uh, if, I, if I were to expand it, which I'd definitely attempt to, I would definitely try experimenting with the other types of color blindness because deutronopia is the most spread out, which is red-green color blindness, but there's also tridonopia, blue-yellow, uh, blue color blindness, and there's very rare case in monochromaticism where it's all black and white, which is extremely rare, so I didn't think it was necessary to test in that specific region. So after all this, I was able to win second place at the Region 5 STEM Fair, and yeah, there's quite a bit of data there. There's three trial sets, uh, all the colors, because it does get hazy at the part where you think about how do you record color or classify darkness. So. In computer programming, their scale RGB colors is from 0 to 255. And when it's uh, 0, uh, it's absolute white. When it's 255, it's absolute black. And it's the theory in computer programming that every color could be made in that range. And so that's how I'm able to, you know, this is this color. It has this amount of red, this amount of green, this amount of blue in it. So yeah, that's the entirety of my project. Mayor Colt, members of the school committee, thank you for having us here. I want to take too much time, as Mr. Gilbert said, um, just hearing some of our students already. They, our students are wicked smart all right now. <laughs> that's, that's, all, that's what I'm getting out of it at this point. Um, but I, I do want to introduce um, our science department chair, Ms. Julie Krieger, coming up here. I uh, really want to thank her, the rest of our science department um, staff and students. Um, she'll go over our numbers specifically. We had over 100 students as well participate in the STEM fair. And again, just seeing the event um, from start to finish, seeing the judges that are there. Um, one of the questions that I ask every student is like, what's the timetable? How long it took for you to do that? And those times kind of varied. Um, but one thing that you'll notice, you know, you heard it already from the two students I went before and our two students that are coming as well. Um, the attention to detail through the whole process, right? We, we always talk about process, right? And, and seeing things through all the way. And that was evident through the STEM fair. And you know, at Quincy High School, we're extremely proud of our students and what they were able to do, um, not only through this um, experiment, um, but really all facets of life um, and what they're doing in our, our school. Our two students that are coming up here are, have not only been involved in the STEM fair and going to regional and state, they're also involved in, in several clubs and activities representing Quincy High School the right way. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Ms. Julie Krieger. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Good evening, Mayor Koch, Superintendent Mulvey, and members of the school committee. My name is Julie Krieger, and I'm the Science Department Chair at Quincy High School. It is an extreme honor to celebrate the work of some of our outstanding students tonight. On Tuesday, February 7th, approximately 100 students presented to over 75 judges and 200 spectators at the 14th Annual Quincy High School STEM Fair. The fair featured 100 projects from grades 9 through 12, exploring the fields of biology, chemistry, environmental science, physics, and engineering. Students worked individually or as a cooperative team to investigate topics such as the effect of ocean acidification on shells, turning plants into sustainable fuel sources, designing, designing solar-powered vehicles, optimizing battery performance, and measuring vitamin levels in foods. Projects were scored by community-based judges from a variety of different backgrounds, including PhD students, algorithm developers, water quality scientists, 
engineers, nurses, chemists, and neurobiologists, to name a few, who judge, use judging criteria based on scientific approach, reasoning, and presentation skills. From our Quincy High School Fair, we had two students move on to the Region 5 Fair in March at Bridgewater State University. Mira Dula, our STEM Fair first place winner, earned a second place showing at the Regional Fair and will be moving on to the Massachusetts State Fair at MIT on May 5th. Tonight, I am honored to recognize the top three projects from our Quincy High School STEM Fair, which were completed by Mira Dula, Suginathan Yamini, Christina, Christiana Nguyen, Rory Gorham, Dante Nguyen, and Mina Altakridi. I would now like to welcome our first place winner, Mira Dula, to present her project on the exhibit of invisible radiation from ionizing particles through condensation nuclei. Hi, I'm Mira Dula Suginathan Yamni, and as Ms. Krieger said, my project was the exhibit of invisible radiation from condensation nuclei using ionizing particles. Um, for instance, in our world, we have radiation all around us, but we don't realize and see it because it's invisible to our eyes. But we humans produce radiation, the soil, this microphone, everything produces radiation. In my project, I made a prototype for a portable device that turns this invisible radiation visible to the human eyes and quantifies it using measuring the amount of radiation produced by ionizing emitting objects. And ionizing em emitting objects are nothing but objects that produce ionizing radiation which is background radiation. I use important processes. So the purpose for this project was to quantify radiation around us and make sure that scientists and data analysis could use these projects and innovate further techniques for measuring radiation. I use chemical properties of condensation nuclei, which is a tiny particles of solid or liquid found in our surroundings that help vapor convert into liquid and supersaturated vapor which is a vapor that needs condensation nuclei to convert into a liquid, and this is found from isopropyl. I merged these concepts together to make radi invisible radiation visible through radiation tracks. I also used dry ice, which we all know is about a negative 109 degrees Fahrenheit, and I built a portable device of a cloud chamber, which is like a constant environment where I can accurately measure my data. Because in total, I had 300 trials, and accuracy is crucial for my experiment. Um, there are very positive and negative aspects of radiation. Too much radiation and too much exposure to human skin can cause cancer and various other diseases like acute radiation syndrome. But in the positive light, if you use the right amount of radiation and measure it using my project, and you'd be able to focus on a particular body part, you can potentially prevent cancer from spreading. Also, for chemistry labs and people who work in nuclear energy plants, there is excess radiation around them all the time. If we build a portable device like my project, it could potentially save lives. If there's too much radiation around them, it could warn them to evacuate and it could save their lives. However, the main crucial field of science that I was investigating was space in a growing international and local interest in space exploration, space expansion, and even settling on Mars, for instance. Being able to measure the radiation in our outer space and surroundings is crucial. And um, like I said, there were 300 trials, and patience was really important for this project. Each trial was for 10 minutes, and accuracy is important because every single aspect of environmental factors could affect my data. Outer sunlight has radiation too, so that could affect traffic outside. So keeping all these things in mind, I provided my best data I could and using all the consistent consistency, accuracy, and I have a lot of tenacious towards space. I have an interest in aerospace for my future. I'm considering it, but we'll see. As a sophomore from Quincy High, I'm honored to also go to regionals win second place and moving on to MIT to represent my school and, of course, Quincy. And that's my project. Thank you. Good, e good evening, everyone. My name is Mina El Takridi, and I'm a junior at Quincy High. Um, my project was to determine whether or not the amount of calcium in a food substance would affect the process of spherification. What is the process of spherification? Um, the process of spherification involves forming a semi-solid sphere out of a liquid. Um, using sodium alginate and calcium chloride. Um, once this thin gel membrane around the liquid bursts, uh, it creates a pop effect in our mouths. 
Um, and these are often known as popping boba. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so in my experiment, I used liquids with um, different calcium levels, and I mixed it with sodium alginate and used a dropper to drop it into a calcium chloride bath. The reason that these gel membranes form is that the calcium replaces the sodium and fo forms bonds with alginate uh, and eventually creating a um, large network, which to us looks like the sh thin gel membrane. So I've used high calcium liquids such as milk and coffee, as well as low calcium liquids such as grenadine syrup and 7-Up um, soda. And the reason that high calcium liquids tend to not form thin gel membranes is because the calcium in the liquid prematurely reacts with the alginate rather than reacting with the calcium in the calcium chloride solution. Um, and therefore, what we get is a a uh, string, a lumpy string, instead of the gel membrane that would pop in your mouth. The reason I chose that uh, this field of science is was, is because I think that food sciences are generally overlooked, and people don't really look at food and think of science. And I want to show people that even in cooking and even in daily things that you eat, there's still science involved. Thank you. Okay, questions, comments from the committee. Mrs. Hubley. I was just going to say these are all absolutely fascinating. You all did a wonderful job. Congratulations, and I wish you all the best at MIT, and I hope you come back and tell us uh, the conclusion, because that's amazing. So I'm just in awe. So that was great. Thank you. Thank you so much for presenting to us. Mrs. Lebo. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Santoro. Incredible, just incredible. What a representation you are of our city and our schools and our teachers. K through 12, and I am so, so proud of what you have accomplished in the amount of testing that you did to stay on track with those projects is unbelievable to have that kind of focus. So you are going to be great, whatever you decide to do when you finish at high school. Mr. Gattro. I just want to say uh, exceptional diversity of projects. You know, I, I spend my days, I work for the US Environmental Protection Agency working with a lot of scientists. Um, and there's some really dense stuff out there that's super hard to understand, but you explained it extraordinarily well. Each of you did that. Um, and, and, you know, uh, especially on, on the, the pond issue and the phosphorus and the nitrogen issue, big issue, especially on Cape Cod, recreational impacts is a big deal. Um, I'm colorblind, red-green colorblind, so your presentation was incredibly meaningful to me. Um, you know, the other two presentations, superb. I mean, really the technical competency that you have to have on, on some of those. And then the interest in aerospace, I think you mentioned that. My brother works for NASA. If you ever need a job, give me a call. <laughs> we'll put you in touch. So. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Anybody else? Well, Ms. Mrs. Cahill. I'm not as smart as Mr. Gutro, <laughs> so I didn't understand any of it, really. Um, but um, And you're all super smart, and I think probably smarter than most of us here. Um, and, and I think one of the things that um, resonates with me and being on the school committee is that you have the resources here to really explore the things that you're interested in. And I think you should be proud of the fact that you have ex taken that opportunity and really used it to um, you know, follow your interests in the, th in the things that you're doing. Um, I can be a human um, specimen for you to prove that people's eyesight does change once you hit 40. <laughs> and um, and uh, but but thank you and and best of luck. You guys are brilliant. That's great. Mr. Pagoli. Yeah, eyesight does change. Uh, <laughs> sometimes things look better now. <laughs> Um, I just want to uh, thank all of you for all your hard work. That's just incredible what you've done. Um, you've made your school proud. You made us proud. And I'd just like to um, recognize um, where this all started. Uh, Wilma Shields, back at North Quincy High School uh, many, many, many years ago, started the first um, uh, science fair at North Quincy High School. And I'm glad to see it's, it's continuing on such great leadership of uh, the two department heads we have here tonight. So I thank you 
for all your hard work, and you guys are amazing. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Okay, we're going back to the uh, old business. Oh yes, we'll we'll take a recess for a minute here. Twenty-three, two thousand twenty-four, Quincy Public Schools year calendar. Uh, Mr. Bergoli to present. Okay, we're, um, we we if we make a motion, uh, we'll table the motion. Okay. Um, I think the motion has to be made to table. Well, you can't. You, you don't table the agenda item. You table the motion. But Mrs. Lebo, you have the floor. I withdraw my motion. Okay. <laughs> okay. We can table the motion once it's made. If you wish, go ahead, Mr. Bergoli. We've uh, had this before us uh, uh, a couple other times uh, when we had the school calendar, and uh, it's, uh, it was a great presentation by the by the uh, young people tonight. Uh, I was very impressed with them. So, is there any discussion on this? Uh, we're not going to vote on it tonight. We could. No, it's not. Oh, oh no, it's got to go another May meeting. Third we vote on yeah. It. Right. So. Is there any further discussion on this? Well, there's Mrs. Lebo. Mrs. Lebo. Yeah. I make a motion to put it back into I make a motion to put it back into policy. Okay, to put the item back into policy. Not a motion, but to put the item back. This is Mrs. Owens. Um, can I just say, if you put it back into policy, we might actually run out of time in the school year to get it through the steps. So, I mean, I think you can... You can just make the amendment here, if you. I'm not. Re I'm not ready to make an amendment yet. You're not. Okay. All right. So the policy subcommittee is April 26. That's the next policy subcommittee meeting. If you want to meet sooner. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gatro. I can meet anytime. Mr. Mm -hmm. Gatro, you have the floor. Is it possible to leave it before us, and as I understand it, it still appears in policy. Can't we have a discussion in policy and leave it here and then do both, essentially? Because it, it's in both right now. But it came out of policy and, yeah. and that you have it presented to you? So it's not sitting in policy right now? It's not like if, if no, I look got at the advanced. policy. It got advanced from, it is still on the list because it hasn't been on, removed. It's on the list. So right. can, we, can we discuss it in policy without mm -hmm. removing it or objecting or delaying it tonight? Can we discuss it at the next policy meeting? I don't see why we can't. Yes, you can, but you, it still has to sit in it. If you revise it, it would have to appear on two agendas unless you vote to suspend your procedures. Understood. Okay, Chairman. Mr. Koch. Um, these rules are developed by this committee. We can yeah. change <laughs> yes. those rules anytime we want. So uh, we don't have to necessarily stand by that uh, two meetings being on. If, right. So I, I'd suggest we do go back to policy, have that discussion, and come back and, and uh, make a decision. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There is no motion other than it's still in policy, just removed from the agenda. Okay. Item B, proposed revision of the school committee policy book, uh, section 5.23, 2.3, emergency closings. Mr. Bergoli. So it sits here and we're going to be voting on it. Um, is it May 4th? Okay, that's it? Okay, item um, 5B, MCAS and accountability update. Ms. Perkins, Ms. Roy, and Mr. Tierney to present. Yours. Thank you. And those are the okay, so leave it here for now. 
for now. Good evening, Assistant Superintendent Aaron Perkins and Christopher Tierney, Coordinator of District Data and Accountability, and myself are here tonight to present some new released accountability data for districts and schools to give you a preview of what our principals and superintendents leadership team members are reviewing right now and to share some new accountability targets for Quincy Public Schools. Last week, the three of us participated in a state webinar around the release of the 2023 accountability targets, um, which we were obviously interested in learning about, as well as to learn about new MCAS quartiles and pathways uh, to making progress towards our target. So we attend these webinars so we get a good sense of what the state is rolling out for us uh, for their, before their uh, public release. The reality is this data is late in the school year. This is 2023 um, uh, data. Um, however, it's here and it's worthy of analyzing because it represents our students and our schools. And so we will give it its due diligence and the principals will do the same. They will review it and analyze it and see if what's currently being presented um, aligns with their school improvement um, goals and action steps. And we will continue whichever uh, team needs to take a focus on a certain group of students. We will make sure that we do that. So uh, for the agenda, we just want to give you a brief reminder of why ESSA is related to accountability. Um, we want to take the time to share the uh, state's 2023 MCAS test administration windows that our students are participating in. And uh, we will show and discuss some models of how the state reports our MCAS achievement data and determines our accountability targets. So um, as we have learned that behind every uh, great school and district accountability report is a very large federal mandate. And that's what every uh, Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA as we call it, is. Um, this is the current federal K-12 education law of the United States. The main purpose of ESSA is to make sure public schools provide a quality education for all students, which um, there is no doubt Quincy does a magnificent job at. Um, different from the previous No Child Left Behind, which was a one-size-fits-all states mandate, ESSA gives states the flexibility to develop their own customizable targets based on the visions that come out of their state Department of Education. So while, we, while the focus remains on academic achievement as measured through MCAS scores and uh, student growth, Massachusetts also includes other indicators which Chris and Erin uh, will talk about within the presentation. Our State Department of Education measures the progress of each school and district through a public accountability report, which when it becomes public, it will be in early October. So this really is a preview. Because um, MCAS achievement and student growth is such a focus of the accountability report, we just wanted to share um, our MCAS uh, schedule with you. This is the state's, these are the state's windows um, what happens at your child's uh, or your students, our students' individual schools. Um, that schedule is created by their principal and um, the grade level teachers who are responsible for proctoring. Our grade 10 students this week have just completed two sessions of English language arts with tomorrow being the last day for makeup and then that window closes for English language arts for grade 10. In May and June, they will continue testing. They'll have two identified dates for, um, for testing, uh, for math and science, uh, with some designated days for makeup. The high school windows are a little are tighter than our um, elementary and middle schools, probably because there's so many of us and there's a lot of uh, schools that need to test. So the, um, for the parents and guardians who are listening tonight, um, I'm sure they have already received some sort of notification about the MCAS schedule. It could come out through a parent weekly or newsletter. It could come out through um, instant alert. It could come out through an email through Aspen, or it could be posted on the website. If they have any questions as to when their child is testing, I encourage them to reach out to their school. They can always reach out to Erin and I as well. And now I'm going to turn this over to Erin. 
Good evening. So I have the fun job of explaining to you the new accountability system, which if the old one wasn't confusing, this one sure is. So um, so what the state uh, has done is I, I think they've make it, made it just like way more complicated than it ever needed to be. But um, so they have created two paths. So based on your accountability data, um, you will be placed into either a recovery path or a forward path. And we're going to talk about uh, both paths and what those mean because they do impact our schools. So those paths are based on data at the district level, the school level. It's broken into content. And so by content, I mean ELA, math, and science, which is our typical content areas, and then student groups. So for instance, lowest performing students, students with disabilities, EL, um, they've taken the standard scores of each of, and I'll explain in a little bit how they did that. They've taken the standard scores, the scaled scores of, of those different groups in the individual content areas. And from there, they have divided us into these, the, into these pathways. Now, the interesting thing is that you could be in forward in math and recovery in ELA. So it really, it kind of runs the gamut. And I think what you're going to see as we go through where we are in terms of our different grade levels and content areas is that, you know, for the, I think it's not surprising for the most part we're recovery and in some places we're forward. Um, so we, you know, we went through all of the MCAS data with you in the fall. And so I know we know that was a while ago, but obviously some of the big highlights were that we did see significant dips in ELA not as significant in math, but still there. Um, and so I think that you'll see that reflected in, in the, thing, the information that we share with you tonight. So we'll start with the forward path, which we have uh, in, in our office, this is, we have been talking about quartiles and paths and scaled scores <laughs> for the past week since we uh, watched this webinar and reading over all of the different uh, manuals and uh, information sheets that we could find. I, I thought that the forward path was the easier path. I'm not, I'm not quite sure now after researching it. So basically, for the most part, and I want to say for the most part because there are exceptions in, in terms of the forward path. So for the most part, um, MCAS achievement, you are placed on the forward path if the MCAS achievement was greater than or equal to your 2019 achievement results. So you either did uh, the same as 2019 or you did better than. There are some exceptions to those rules. We're not going to go into all that tonight because we still are struggling to understand that. Um, but there are some places where it just doesn't make sense. Um, so each school and student group is assigned an improvement increment based on their 2022 MCAS results. So it's very similar to what it was in the, pa in the past if you're on a forward path. They give you an incremental increase with a new target that you're supposed to reach within the year, um, at, you know, when you take the, the next MCAS tests. Um, and it, it's pretty similar. It is based on um, they, what they did was they basically looked at schools that were performing, like had similar performances to you. They looked at the schools that improved. And of those improvers, they took the median improvement. And that's how they based their the, the targets, the, the points that you have to improve. So it is very confusing. We understand this. And we'll do our best to make it as understandable as possible. And obviously, if you have questions, we're happy to try to answer them. So. The path that most, I would say, we see the most, and I think that this is the same across the district, is the recovery path. And so the recovery path, basically what it means is your 2019 MCAS scores were higher than your 2020 MCAS scores. So you, you, know, you did better in 2019, which is the majority of districts, did better in 2019 than they did in 2022. So these groups people that are on the recovery path or, um, you know, subgroups, these groups experience declines in student achievement and are expected to improve achievement in a, spe a specified number of years to return and ultimately surpass their 2019 achievement results. So in order to do this, the state did recognize that in some cases when you have a 10-point difference uh, between your scaled score in 2019 and 2022, you can't make that up in one year. That's not possible. So they did recognize that it could take multiple years in order for districts to get back to where they were in 2019. So how they addressed that, 
they divided all of the districts in Massachusetts, all of the schools, into uh, quartiles. So there are four quartiles, and you are placed on the recovery path in your quartile, and your quartile determines the number of years that you have to recover. So your, to your 2019 levels of achievement. It's based on how significant the decline is, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute, and how they figured that out was it's basically the difference in the average scaled score between 2022 and 2019. So and I'll explain this in a, in a minute, but if you have a 10 point uh, drop in your scores, you're gonna be placed in one quartile. If you have a five point drop in a score, you'll be placed in a different quartile. So here's the quartiles. Um, so quartile one, if you're placed in quartile one, you have four years to recover. If you're placed in quartile two, you have three years. Quartile three, you have two years. Quartile four, you have one year. So just to kind of give you an idea of, um, you know, what, where we kind of fall with this. So in quartile one, which is four years, which we found very confusing. We don't understand why they didn't say quartile four was four years. But <laughs> to have them reverse numbers is, has made it very difficult for us this week. Um, so, we, so for quartile one, you would have had a t at least a 10, if, say ELA, because it's different for ELA and math it's different for high school versus non-high school. So we'll go with non-high school students, ELA, you would have had to have had a 10 point drop or more in order to be found in quartile four. In quartile two in ELA, I'm sorry, quartile, see, I did it again. <laughs> quartile one, thank you. Quartile one, you would have had to have a 10 point drop or more. In quartile two, you would need to have a 7.3 drop or more to be found in quartile two. In quartile three, it's uh, 4.5 or more. And in um, quartile one, it's less than 4.5. I'm sorry, quartile four, it's less than 4.5. Now I'm gonna do that all night. So this is basically across the state, um, you know, what, what the state found. So in terms of non-high schools and ELA, there's about 1,226 schools that are in the recovery path, um, and there's 214 high schools. Uh, same thing in math, you see a little over 1,000 schools, um, are non-high schools are in the recovery path, and 196 high schools in science is 424 non-high schools and 306. So you can see, obviously you see the difference, you see the percentages of schools in the chart below. Um, the recovery path is significantly more than the path forward. Um, so the majority of the schools in Massachusetts are, are, are falling in the recovery path. So now we're going to talk about um, how we did. And so we're, we're, we took this, uh, we looked, this is all district data, so we did not break this down by schools, but the individual schools do have their data. Um, and so just, you know, to kind of go over just a few. So for our non-high schools, which is, you know, our, our, all of our schools that service children in grades three to eight, um, for ELA as a district, we were found to be in the recovery path, which again is not surprising given you know, what we know about our MCAS scores and what we saw um, in the fall. And so we were found to be in quartile one, which means we have four years to recover for that. Um, so our drop there was just about 9.7. So um, we were very close to that uh, 10 point mark. In math, we're also in the recovery uh, pathway. And for this, again, we did score a little bit higher. Um, our scale scores were a little bit higher in math um, than they were in ELA this year. And so we were placed in quartile two, which means we have three years to recover. In science, uh, we were um, placed in a forward path, which is great. You know, so we had pretty similar scores to years prior um, in terms of our science scores. For high school, uh, uh, they have a recovery path for ELA, um, and we're in quartile three, and which means we have two years to recover, and our drop there was just about three points, so not as significant as our three to eight ELA. I think in general, our high schools did pretty well. They're not, they're, they're minimal drops compared to, you know, some of the other grade levels, which is nice to see. Math, we were placed on a path forward, 
and science. Um, we were in the recovery, and the quartile we were placed in was four, which means we have one year to recover, and our drop there was only 2.6. So not, not a terrible uh, drop from the years before. So for EL and former EL, um, I won't go through all of them, but you can see the majority is um, we're placed in quartile one, which means that we have four years to recover. Um, on the ELA side, we did see some more you know, significant drops. We um, ranged from 13, a 13-point 13 drop in ELA uh, and to a 5.9 uh, drop in science. So we had you know, a big range there. Um, and then for our high school students, um, we are also in recovery. Uh, we have, we're in quartile, the range is, it ranges. We're in quartile two, quartile one, and quartile two again. Um, so our ELA score, we did not see a, a significant drop. It, was, it wasn't as significant as the other grades, I should say. It was a 3.7 for our high school EL students and former ELs. And for math, it was a little bit more. It was a 9.6. And for science, something we will need to focus on, it was a 10.9. So a, a more significant. And for um, students with disabilities, um, we also, you know, um, have a mix of recovery and forward. Again, you know, I think our high school students, which was nice to see, and um, I'll talk about that in a second, but we really didn't see significant drops at the, in the high school in terms of our students with disabilities, which I think is a credit to our staff and our students. Um, but in the non-high school for students with disabilities, for ELA, you know, we're quartile one, so we have four years similar to the all district, all students, and we saw about a 9.7 drop, which is pretty similar to what all our all students was. In math, we're also in recovery, but we're a little higher, quartile two, three years to recover, and it was a seven point drop. Um, and um, for high school, we're in recovery for ELA, but it was only a three-point drop, which um, you know we were happy about. Math run uh, moving forward, and for science, we're in quartile four with one year to recover, and it was a 2.6 drop, so not um, as significant. And then finally, lowest performing students, which Maddie and uh, you know Chris are going to talk about. We we do have lowest performing students again. We have chronic absenteeism again. You, you all kinds of fun stuff. So um, we will, you know. So they did give us the list, as Christopher said. I just want to highlight, and we'll talk again about it at the end of the presentation. That they gave us this list in February. Children take MCAS in April, so you know it, it's it, it's really unfortunate that they waited that long to um, provide the list to us. But um, this is where we're at. We have um, in ELA, we're on our the forward path, which is good. In recovery, we're in quartile one. We have four years uh, for math, and we did see a pretty significant drop there. But again, we're not talking about the same students as in 2019. You know, this group changes. It's the lowest 25% of the district. So it is not the same children. They're looking at 2019 data. This is not the same kids. And so based on 2019 data from now, there was a 14 point drop in math. So that is, that is concerning and it definitely is something that we're working on and Maddie will talk about the things that we're doing to address that concern. And now I'll turn it over to Chris. Oh, oh sorry, Maddie, sorry, Maddie. Okay, so there's a lot going on on this slide. Um, we're looking at our designated paths and quartiles for non-high schools. Those are our schools with grades three through eight, uh, broken out by race and ethnicity across all three tested subjects. So just to, a couple of uh, takeaways here. We're designated as recovery um, for all groups in ELA and math. And depending on our quartile, we have three to four years to meet or exceed our uh, 2019 targets. We see a very positive forward pathways for science, um, and this would be for tested grades five and eight. Yet we want to look further into student data for one of our cohorts designated as recovery. <clears throat> On this slide, we're looking at our designated paths and quartiles for our combined high schools, uh, their achievement results for grade 10, 
students broken out by race, ethnicity across all three tested subjects. And the takeaways here are that we see a lot more cohorts designated in a positive forward pathway, which is great news across all three of the subjects. Uh, we do need to take a closer look at two cohorts with a quartile designation of a two or a three. We need to identify um, the obstacles to learning there so that we can provide the supports, the academic supports that these students need. So with the help of our, of our coordinators, um, we listed some of the um, sort of the biggest uh, steps to recovery. We have been mentioning these throughout the year in our uh, presentations. Um, and uh, starting when we presented our data, we were already on it. So to Aaron's point that the lowest performing student data came out so tremendously late, it's, it's um, our, our principals and our department chairs and our specialists are already on this data in September. We can, you know, as long as we have MCAS results, we can do the calculations. And Chris has been a tremendous help um, to our schools. But here are some good things that we wanted to highlight for you, um, things that we already have in process uh, for English language arts. Um, you heard just recently when Bridget Vaughn was here talking about the GLEAM grant. Um, one of the major initiatives that came out of that grant was that she developed a district-wide um, K-8 literacy action plan addressing a lot of things, but particularly instruction, high-quality resources, professional development, and updates to assessment screeners. So everything we can do to keep our teachers up to date in best practice and make sure that we have high-quality materials and um, assessment screeners so that we can identify students um, who are in need of support. And we want to thank you very much for your support for those things. Um, another highlight is that we have a new group of educators and specialists who will participate in Orton-Gillingham training this summer and fall. We have 24 teachers who have signed up. This is very intensive professional development. And they, um, they have to do an awful lot of work. And they are also observed. Um, and monitored in order to get their final certification. So as Erin tells me, this is not my area. This is a systematic, uh, phonetic-based approach to reading, and it's very, very important, uh, particularly at our younger grades. Um, and lastly, I just want to point out that our English language arts teachers have participated in DZ's updated professional development around writing expectations. So when they last summer when they shared out that across the state there was this pretty significant dip in English language arts. And we, we mentioned this in October. There is, um, it's, the writing scores are uh, uh, definitely an area of concern and not just um, the writing, but also children not completing the writing portions. So they will do that for their teacher in class for an assignment, but when it came to the MCAS test, they were avoiding um, answering. So we weren't able to measure, at least through MCAS, um, how they did. So uh, the state put out some new professional development, and Bridget made sure that our um, upper elementary and middle school teachers got involved in that professional development. And Erin and I have seen evidence of, of that practice going on. Uh, steps to recovery for mathematics. Um, of course, you're already familiar uh, with our adoption of illustrative mathematics, which is a high quality resource. Um, and it's rolling out in K to five classrooms with support from principals, Kim Quinn and her math interventionists. Um, this um, high quality resource already aligned with professional development that we had in place and implemented for the last four years prior to bringing this in. And again, we appreciate the financial support um, for this adoption. Uh, for middle school, another highlight would be that they've been exploring Desmos. And um, it, Kim and I have been talking about this, and the high school is also taking an approach utilizing some of the Desmos uh, curriculum materials. It's, um, it's a free, for middle school, it's a free interactive online platform. So they, they are getting screen time. However, um, what they're used to in elementary school is having the manipulatives on their desk so that they can work on the conceptual. Um, so even as they kind of graduate up through the years and their abstract becomes stronger, they still need to solidify those foundational skills. So this uh, is turning out to be a wonderful tool. Um, so something that we are implementing to support our students in mathematics. Um, 
The other thing is, and I'm going to be able to experience this next week with middle school professional development, we have connected the expertise of Heather Wojcik, our EL coordinator, and her EL team, um, and we are connecting them, we, we have connected them with our middle school math educators, and they did, Heather provided training around the three key principles, uh, which when practiced, no matter what the subject is, so we're going to do this in science next week, it helps children, our EL students uh, develop their comprehension of the subject, of their subject knowledge. It helps them to interact in the classroom during learning time, and it increases their higher order thinking skills. So that's in-house um, homegrown professional development that we're, we're trying out. Um, and the math teachers were so pleased, we've decided to bring it to other content areas. So anything we can do to help our, um, our students with their mathematics, whether they're uh, students with disabilities, students with EL, or just students um, in our, on a regular pathway who struggle with concepts. And now we'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Manny. Uh, good evening, members of the school committee. I will be taking you through our 2023 uh, accountability targets, which were recently distributed to districts across the state. Uh, the state has acknowledged the late release of these targets uh, for this year, and they are aiming to uh, have the 2024 targets out to us in the fall. The 2023 uh, accountability report signals a return uh, to full accountability system since the COVID pandemic began. This includes the lowest performing student groups, which I will be going over uh, in detail on the next slide. The normative com component or accountability percentile, which measures uh, the performance of all students in a school compared to other schools in the state. Uh, the overall classifications uh, system that the state uses to identify schools that may need uh, assistance or intervention. And finally, uh, the schools of recognition, uh, which are identified for their academic accomplishments. So the lowest performing student group, or LPS uh, as we call it, is an indicator that aims to highlight and close proficiency gaps that may exist within a school or district. Students are identified as LPS based on their average ELA and math MCAS scores. The lowest 25% of students will then be placed in, the, in a school or district's LPS group. Uh, students are identified using the cohort model, uh, which means a student must have been enrolled in their current school the year prior, as well as have taken the MCAS in that same school for both years. Due to this fact, there is no LPS group for high school students. Chronic absenteeism has also been changed for 2023. This, the state has returned to identifying students who missed 10% or more school days as opposed to the 20% threshold uh, that was used last year. Uh, missing 10% of school days uh, roughly equates to uh, missing 18 or more days of school. Uh, the rate includes students enrolled uh, in grades 1 through 12 who have been enrolled in a school or district for more than 20 days at any time during the year. Students in preschool or kindergarten are not included uh, in district or school rates. Progress towards English language proficiency is the percentage of current EL students that have made progress towards their access targets, which reflect the annual improvement needed to reach English proficiency in six years. Students who meet or exceed their access targets are considered to have made progress. For accountability determinations, graduation and dropout targets are lagged by a year, hence why, you see, why you're seeing the 2022 uh, instead of 2023. Using lag data allows DESE to use data that has been thoroughly analyzed by district and DESE staff prior to release. Our four-year graduation rate is the percentage of students in a cohort that graduate from high school in four years or less. And the annual dropout rate is the percentage of high school students that drop out in any given year. And finally, we have our high school advanced coursework completion, which represents the percentage of students in grade 11 and 12 who complete at least one advanced course 
Advanced courses include our standard advanced classes, as well as advanced placement, dual enrollment, and Chapter 74 vocational or technical programs. So just in summary, um, you know, we are so fortunate that for the principals and the superintendent's leadership team um, and the teachers and interventionists and all of the staff that we work with, because although this information was released, released in March, which as I mean, I think it's just ridiculous, um, you know, our schools do not wait for that information. You heard all of the school improvement plans in the fall. You know, you've heard throughout the year, you know, uh, Kim was here and Bridget were here presenting on illustrative math and um, CKLA and we've seen the math interventionists and, um, you know, liter uh, we've heard about the literacy intervention. So, you know, I, I think you've, you've heard all of the great work that is happening throughout the district that we, we did not when we received our data, not just this year but last year as well. We that our schools, our staff, our teachers, our students have worked really hard to recover from the COVID nineteen pandemic. They didn't wait for the Department of Ed to release their data in March. They've been working on it for the past two years. Um, so although we're frustrated, I, as other districts are, at the lateness of this information. Um, we do know and we feel very confident that Maddie, you know, and I have been in classrooms all over the city that there is great stuff happening in this district. We don't need to wait for the Department of Education to tell us what we need to work on. We do that ourselves and um, we have been working on it, you know, for a long time. And so in terms of accountability, we are back to our full accountability system. We'll probably talk more with you about chronic absenteeism and how we'll start to monitor that. You know, next year at this point, you know, it's it's too late to to jump into that now. Um, and um, the, they're telling us that our new accountability data for next year will be released sometime in September and October. So um, so this is where we're at. We just wanted you to know that this was the information that we we've just been given, and uh, we're happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Comments? Mr. Gattro. Um cl Clear as mud, <laughs> as, as you said. Yeah. It's, it's some pretty dense stuff. Um, so I have three things. Um, one, does this suggest that um, the younger students were the most directly impacted by COVID learning loss? Is that, I mean, it looks, those numbers, there's more recovery than the high school numbers like there yeah i don't know if you can necessarily say that i mean i think i definitely think younger students were significantly impacted especially because that's you know when students build all those foundational skills like learning to read and mm. write and math so i def i i mean they absolutely were significantly impacted but i also think you know when you talk about high school data you're you're talking about a completely different group of children you know the children that took the test in 2019 are a totally different population than the students that took the test last year, you know? So when it says four years, it's mm -hmm. four years to get back to where they were in 2019. Yeah. And so for some of those high school kids, they could be graduated. They, they, they probably, they are graduated, probably most of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and on, on recovery, so uh, I love that you had all, all the different techniques that, that are going to apply, whether it's ELA or math or science. Is, is that, how, how are those applied? Is it case by case by the student or is it in the classroom that regardless of your learning level in this classroom mm -hmm. where you are, mm -hmm. you know, you, you could, your numbers could say forward, but 90% of the class that you're sitting in says recovery. Mm -hmm. you're still getting the recovery assistance? Is that, uh, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how that, I, how I you target mm -hmm. the students that need to be targeted mm -hmm. without, or, or do you basically just have to do the whole class? Well, I think some things are whole class, and I think some things, and Maddie could probably add to this, some things are pull out. I mean, I think, I think it depends on the need of the student. So, you know, I think the other thing I probably should have said that, uh, you know, when I talked about the response is that we also are so fortunate because you are so supportive, and we have the map 
Um, we now have Amplify for our little ones. Um, we have benchmark assessment. So we don't, we're not waiting for MCAS data in order to identify students who need, you know, potentially remedial support or um, pull out or whatever, or acceleration, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, so I think that sometimes, you know, things happen, whole group, illustrative math, you know, or CKLA, that's happening for the whole class. Everyone's getting that, you know. Um, but then there are times when students need more. But the teachers, we have ILT meetings, you know, multiple times a year where those are the integrated learning teams where they talk about all of the kids, every student, and they move kids' groups around and um, they, you know, they look at, you know, intervention. You know, I think the math interventionists have been unbelievably um, helpful this year. And, uh, you know, they're able to not only go in and take small groups, which you saw when Kim presented, but they can also pull out when needed. So all of those things. So it, it really depends. So there are students, you know, every there's some things that everybody gets, and then there's some interventions or supports that only targeted students get. And I don't know if you want to add. So, and, and it's based on data. We look at data. We use MCAS data, but MCAS data doesn't necessarily, you know, I think we use it like, okay, here it is. This is what we need to work on. But really what we use is our map data, our benchmark data, our assessments, you know, from our different programs. That's what we really use to, um, you know, monitor kids' progress in our schools. And then my last question is on... Um, chronic absenteeism, and mm -hmm. I, I heard what you said. It's a little bit late right now. But um, those numbers just jumped off the page mm -hmm. to me. And, and maybe it's because I don't remember what mm -hmm. the chronic pre-COVID mm -hmm. chronic mm -hmm. absenteeism numbers are. So I'm, I'm curious about the pre-COVID chronic ab absenteeism numbers, number one. Mm -hmm. And then number two, I mean, these aren't tardies. This is absenteeism. Absent, and, yes. and that's 18 to 36 to 50 days a year, mm -hmm. no wonder learning loss is so bad. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So uh, I don't know how we combat that, but mm -hmm. I, I am really interested in that plan mm -hmm. because, you know, you can only blame so much on COVID, but if you've got chronic absentee rates mm -hmm. like that, maybe you're going to say that's every school in the state, that's the same as it's always been for us. But I st and maybe that's been presented to us every year, but to me that's a big area that we really need to, to look yeah at. it's it's really it is a you know the pandemic obviously is unfortunate for a number of reasons but chronic absenteeism I think is one that's really impacted us because before COVID-19 um, we we had we had just we had like recently I think within a year or two we had just um, had about two years maybe of chronic absenteeism being an indicator for us. Mm -hmm. Our schools were killing it with their uh, chronic absenteeism numbers. I think it was like six point one or seven percent total. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so and now I think we, you saw it was like seventeen for the elementary or something, and um, higher for the the high schools. And then 30, yeah, yeah, so it was staggering. significantly lower. I mean, I think our goal was for the district, or I think um, maybe non high schools was like I think it was six point one yeah. somewhere around there mm -hmm. before, and then the pandemic happened. Yeah. So we had um, some of the things that we did, and so we've already we've been talking about this and so that we will go back to is we actually created and obviously now I think there's you know um, easier things that we could potentially use and we're looking into those things but we had actually created workbooks um, for each of our schools at the time like Google was kind of a new thing for us we had created Google workbooks we tracked everything we tracked interventions we tracked family meetings um, we tracked you know if there was something going on with the student and it, it worked we saw significant decreases in our, um, you know, in our absenteeism. And um, so, you know, Mara was obviously a part of that. And so, you know, some of the things that we're looking at, so knowing that that worked before for us, you know, look, thinking about, you know, kind of going back to that um, and reinstating that. But, you know, there's programs, there's a program called Panorama that talks to all your other programs and kind of creates those profiles for you. It puts it all together data, assessment data, can be MAP, MCAS, whatever, attendance data from Aspen, ooh, um, student, student information system data. It brings, like, it brings all of that together and creates a profile for an individual student, a class, or, or um, a grade level or school. 
And so we're looking at things like that, you know, for the future that can help us really target, um, you know, things like chronic absenteeism. But I will say it is complicated because COVID is still here. And it's children that have COVID, um, you know, they, they are out for five days. When, when you're talking 18 days is 10%. I mean, you know, that if you have the flu, you're out for about five days, you know. So um, so that is that is definitely, you know, still it's going to impact us for sure. So I think it's finding that balance, um, you know, trying. We don't want kids to be chronic absentee, you know, offenders. We we want kids in school just for the reasons you, you talked about, Mr. Getro. But so I think it's going to be, you know, really working with families and finding that balance of, you know, what is something that, no, this child should not be in school because we don't want it to go through the entire school. And um, when is it we need to intervene because there's more going on here. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Cahill. Did, did you, um, I, mean, I, don't, I think some of the numbers to me are understandable, like the, the um, English learners and, you know, they have to be present to really be able to, you know, learn and, and, and learn the language and all that. So some of that, some of the numbers I don't think are, um, alarming based on COVID, you know, but I do think, and I appreciate the fact that the MAP scores, and I think that, and I'm assuming, and I think the expectation here is that you look at those scores during the year, and that's mm -hmm. how you base your initiatives and the, the, mm -hmm. the things that you're doing in the classroom. Um, but when, when you got this report, you know, this mandate that the, the state's giving you a couple of things, did you have any way of um, comparing how we are with other school systems? Like, as far as the um, recovery and the forward, you know, that kind of thing. And also, um, what happens when, if you move into, you know, if your score changes instead of in four years, in two years, like, what are they doing? Like, how are they, mm -hmm. are we off a list? Like, what's the- um, Yeah, you can. I don't know, Chris, you know, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. so even if you're, um put into a quartile that you may need four years for recovery. If you meet that and say the next, the next year or two years, you're immediately removed off the recovery path and you're put on a forward path. Okay, that's good. And we do, you know, I mean, I think, um, you know, we look, you know, we, we do look at our, us compared to other school systems. I don't think, you know, I think what we look at is more, um, what, at least for this data in particular, I think we looked more at kind of like the number of, okay, you know, like how many other districts fell in quartile one, you know? So um, things like that to see, you know, and, and it, it's significant. I mean, it's a, it's a ton of uh, districts that fell into quartile one. So, um, you know, so, you know, we do look to see like, we're not the only ones right out here, you know, kind of in this, in this group. Um, but I, I we, I, we didn't look at any maybe surrounding district scores, like a Weymouth or something like that. We didn't look at that. Yeah, I don't think it's provided. Yes, yeah. It's not available to us right now, just our. I just think it would give a good indication as to the work that we are doing, you know, and if we find that we're in a certain recovery group, maybe, you know, the work you're doing, we're, we're doing better than others. And I think it just might be a way to validate the work that you are doing every day, you know, every day in the classroom. Um, and um, also, if you don't meet your four years, in the quartile that you're in, for an example, are they giving you like a penalty or something? <laughs> they have not said no, okay, so we, we don't know. I, I I think then you you, I don't know. I really don't know. I I, I hope we do. <laughs> so no, I'm sure yeah. we will. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to yeah. beat all of those. Yeah, but I'm just sure. curious of how mm. you know what they're presenting to you and what the yeah. you know what they're saying. And, and also to Mr. Guttrow's point about the um, absenteeism, mm -hmm. do we break down like if someone is, has had COVID in yes. that percentage so mm -hmm. we can tell if it's someone that's just mm -hmm. not coming to school or someone who's been sick? Mm -hmm. So we do look at that. Right? We, we, we track everything. I mean, I think some, some obviously we're relying on people to tell us too. You know, yeah. I mean, I think that that can impact it. So, you know, we're, we're hoping, like, if, if your child has COVID, most people will call and let you know that they have COVID. We self-report that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Bergoli. I think I think Mrs. Lebo had her hand up first. Go ahead. Thank you. Mrs. Lebo. I can't stand them. I really can't. I can't. Why do they make this so complicated every single time? I don't understand. And to get this data out on March 22nd and expect us to be actionable 
I mean, it's insane, really. So I know our teachers and our principals and the assessment teams do a phenomenal job, but this is a huge ask. Mm -hmm. It really is a huge ask, and it's kind of infuriating that these people come up with all these things to make your lives and our teachers' lives more difficult mm -hmm. instead of more helpful. Personal opinion. Um, I, when I look at the, um, the state data, what Mrs. Cahill was talking about, the number of schools and the percentage of schools mm -hmm. that are in there, Mm -hmm. So you can sort of see, you don't know which schools they are, but 71.8% of the schools, high schools in ELA, mm -hmm. and you know, 91% of the high schools in science mm -hmm. are in there. So yep. it, it's just, it's, it's not us. No, no. It's not us. Nope. Um, I also want, not only is the map data so actionable that I love it, but even when we heard the presentation about the CKLA, mm -hmm. and they were talking about that pause, mm -hmm. where the kids who got it, they could give them enrichment, and then they paused and made sure those other kids caught up, mm -hmm. which I think is phenomenal. It you know, is. That's a, yeah. that's just a great model. Mm -hmm. It really is a great model. So I'm thrilled that that's built in. The lowest performing students, another one of my favorite topics. There's always going to be 25% of the students who are going to be the lowest performance, even if they're all getting A's. Mm -hmm. There's going to be 25 percent of them, so I, I really don't understand why we're talking about that. I have one question um, for Chris. Uh, the cohort where it says tested in tested in the same school the previous year, the cohort mm -hmm. model. What does that mean? Um, so, in order for the cohort uh, model to work, uh, a student would have to. So, for example, um, a third grader or, or a current fourth grader would have had to have been tested in third grade in that same school. And then now that they're in fourth grade, they would also have to be tested in that same school. So they compare uh, both their years within that school to form like that becomes their cohort as they So as, as they, they move. move from elementary to middle school, does everything start over again? Um, no, no, it, it so like, it, but I mean, it's a, it's a new school. So technically, because it, if it's a single feeder, like a Southwest, you know, then they're going to get they're going to get the right. the scores from the other, you know, the, it would be the fourth grade um, LPS group, right? But if it if it's a multiple feeder school, then um, it, it would be a new list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the um, advanced coursework, I'm assuming you didn't mention it, but I'm assuming early college high school also works with that. Uh, I'm not sure about early college high school. Yeah, um, not positive on that. We'll have to check. Okay. On that I mean, one, it, it should. Mm -hmm. dual, dual enrollment, enrollment dual enrollment yeah. does, but yeah, yeah, dual enrollment definitely does. We can ask Dan Pacho. Yeah, it should, it should, sure. it should work yeah. for that. And the other thing about the absenteeism, I, I, unfortunately, you know, I've known families that the kid wouldn't go back to school with a mask on. So even though they had COVID and they're out for five days, they would not go back to school and wear a mask for five days because they were uncomfortable wearing a mask when nobody else was. Mm -hmm. So they stayed out for the ten days. And I also know some kids who've had COVID twice in the past year or so. Mm -hmm. I don't think your numbers are going to be stellar yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, until the di directions about what we should do if we have COVID change, I think we're going to have, we're going to be facing this unfortunately mm -hmm. in the long I'm very, very appreciative for this. Not, not for this, for you guys, <laughs> for, you, for you guys deciphering it for us and, and bringing it to us. But again, once again, disappointed in the state for making everything so difficult. Mr. Bergoli. Well, my first point was going to be, uh, the commissioner was, uh, middle school principal at one time, wasn't he? Um, or some sure. type of uh, know role in education? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so he's gonna he sends this out to the state. Mm -hmm. It's nonsense. And you said it was unfortunate that you got this at that time. I think it's it's uh, reprehensible. It's unfair to everybody involved. Uh, it because you guys, and I'm including. Uh, SLT and the teachers work extremely hard for our kids on, on a daily basis. And um, for them to do this to us and to you is uh, reprehensible. Um, I'm, I'm glad that Quincy Proactive always has been. It's always been the leader uh, in, uh, and it's a credit to the SLT again and the superintendent and um, and I think the data that we get from our in-house mm -hmm. uh, assessments are way more uh, effective in, in assessing our, our kids. Uh, I really do. Uh, so, you know, I look at this stuff and I say, yeah, yeah that's not so good. But mm -hmm. um, I really, I, I think the most important data that we get is from the assessments that we get on 
uh, a quarterly basis or whatever, however uh, we, we test our kids. And, uh, and then going forward uh, with the absentee rate, I think part of, part of um, our absentee rate is a direct relation to the change of the structure of the family. Uh, I know a lot of parents work. They're assuming their kids are getting out to school, and they're not. Uh, they're somewhere else. And um, that's unfortunate because that's, is, they can't control that. Um, and I'm talking particularly about the middle school and high school, uh, where it's, uh, I think, more prevalent that she's having some difficulties with that. So, um, and, it, and Emily, uh, no, Tina brought it up, the penalty. I mean, what, they're going <laughs> to give you a, a scarlet letter? Uh, I mean, really. Um, and then I heard a couple of years ago um, that the high school level, in order to um, make sure the kid passed the MCAS, that they made the test a little bit easier the next time. Is that something that's still um, being done? Not to my knowledge, no. I, they, I mean, if you don't pass it, you can, you know, obviously have a retake. Mm. Um, and then, you know, if you, depending on how many times you uh, don't, you know, meet the passing standard, you, if you score in a certain range, you can do an educational performance plan, which can also earn you a diploma. Okay. So, but um, no, I don't, I, I mean, I think, I think it's pretty rigorous, whether it's a retake or, a, or, a, you okay. know, the initial. So our kids are not an MCAS jail. They're not, no, no. Um, okay, well, good luck with this. And uh, hopefully going forward, we, uh, we uh, do better, and I know we will, with all your efforts. Thank you. Yeah. This is Hubley. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you very much for this presentation and all your hard work and your team's hard work on this. Um, the accountability data that I need is seeing our students doing these fabulous presentations and the math and literacy presentations that we get where we have videos of what's going on in the classrooms and the amazing work that our teachers are doing. Um, that's the accountability data that I, that I look for and I know that our kids are doing fabulous things in our schools and I appreciate all that and I appreciate all your hard work. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving to item C, Quincy Public Schools Security Assessment Update, Mayor Koch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we, uh, as you know, we, we uh, engaged a company uh, called Secure One. Uh, they have a sub also of CC Tech uh, that's taken an, an assessment of our system, looking at the buildings, looking at our protocols and procedures, looking at uh, equipment and video and doors and, and you name it. Uh, it's right across the board uh, to to our buildings, and uh, so we we have a, an early draft report being circulated to a couple of people involved to make sure that apples are at to apples before we uh, uh, bring it to the committee. And I would expect it'll continue to be in draft form, and uh, perhaps the next school committee meeting we can do this in executive session. I think it makes sense to do this in executive session um, and not to telegraph our punches. So. Uh, with that, if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. But we, my, my guess is we can get you the draft before the next meeting so you have it ahead of time, and then we can discuss it in the executive uh, session. Okay. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Cahill. I just want to say um, thank you to the mayor and for, you know, putting this together and giving us the resources to do this, especially in light of everything that's been happening in this country. Um, I think it's really important that we do the best that we can to make sure that our students and Teachers and staff are safe. I mean, we can't guarantee anything, but we need to do the best that we can, and I, I appreciate that you're doing that. Thank you. And, uh, and it's going to lead to uh, capital investment. Right. It's, it's, sure. Um, there's, some, there's some easy, probably some easy fixes, and that is reminding all our employees. Everyone gets lax, right? You, you, you get a little careless, and mm -hmm. the door gets wedged, and it's open, and mm -hmm. those kinds of things. So we've got to, and I know the superintendent has a plan to address that with each of the principals, and protocols in the schools. But then, of course, there are going to be those other items that are going to be some, probably some major cost items for investment into the technology stuff. So, but we'll talk about it um, when we get the full report and take it from there. Great. 
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, moving to item D. We have <clears throat> school choice participation. This is for discussion and vote. Superintendent Mulvey. Thank you. It is my recommendation tonight that the Quincy School Committee withdraw from enrolling non-resident students in the Quincy Public Schools for the 2023-2024 academic year for the following reasons. First, the level of current and projected enrollments at elementary, middle, and high schools. And second, adherence to the Quincy School Committee policy on class size. Based on that, I would ask this committee to uh, vote to uh, withdraw from enrolling um, in um, school choice. So moved. On a motion of Mayor Koch, seconded by Mrs. Lebo. Superintendent, please call the roll. Mr. Bagoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gattro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Mayor Koch? Yes. Sir. Thank you. Item E, grant. Museum of Science Engineering uh, is essential. It's curriculum for grades three through five, valued at 80,000. Superintendent Mulvey. Thank you. As was discussed at the uh, last week's Teaching and Learning Subcommittee meeting, uh, the Quincy Public Schools will partner with the Museum of Science to implement the Essentials and Engineering curriculum for grades three to five next school year. The Museum of Science will provide curriculum materials and professional development with an estimated value of $80,000. With that, I would request a motion to accept uh, this grant. Okay, on a motion of Mrs. Hubley, seconded by Mrs. Lebo, we approve. Superintendent, call the roll. Mr. Bagoli? Yes. Mrs. Yes. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gattro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Mayor Cove? Yes. Thank you. How does street travel? We have uh, Atherton Howe Elementary, grade 5, to Canopy Lake. Um, do we have a motion? Or uh, Superintendent, do you want to discuss these? Uh, we're just asking for a motion to okay. approve the out of state On travel. A motion of Mrs. Lebo, seconded by Mr. Bogoli. We approve the Atherton Howe trip. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, second trip is Southwest Middle School, grade 8 to Canopy Lake. On a motion of Mrs. Lebo, seconded by Mrs. Hubley, we approve. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And the ayes have it. Thank you. Okay, we have, uh, we have a school committee policy, book 1.7, wellness policy. This is referral by Mrs. Cahill to um, subcommittee. Any discussion? No. Okay, so moved. Uh, item H, we have high school policy book 10.19, concussion policy. Again, Mrs. Cahill refers this to the policy subcommittee. All, okay, all set. Item H, move to the subcommittee. Item I, uh, on a motion of Mr. Koch, seconded by um, Mrs. Lebo, we move this to after executive session. Um, do we need a roll call or we just? Well, I, I, I would suggest we, we yes. move into executive session now and then come back. Uh, we've got to affirm the vote anyway. So I'd make a motion we take executive session out of order okay. and move to that now. Okay, seconded by Mrs. Lebo. Superintendent, uh, Superintendent, please call the roll. Mr. Bagoli? Yes. Mrs. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gattro? Yes. Mrs. Hubley? Yes. Mrs. Lebo? Yes. Mrs. Santoro? Yes. And Mayor Cove? Yes. Okay, we will be returning. Okay, we're back in session. Um, we're going. Yeah, kick cousin kick on it. Okay. We're back in session. Um, we'll go back to item I on the agenda, the memorandum of agreement with the Quincy Education Association, Unit A. This is up for a vote. Mayor Koch. Yes, I'd be happy to make the motion to approve the contract between the Quincy Education Association and the Quincy School Committee in effect for the year period from September 1st, 2022 through August 31st of 2025. Seconded by Mrs. Lebo. Superintendent, any discussion on the matter? Superintendent Collaro. Mr. Bagoli? Yes. Cahill? Yes. Mr. Gatro? Yes. Mrs. Yes. 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 Thank you. Item six, additional business. I don't see any <clears throat> at this time. Item seven, communications. Upcoming school committee meetings, May 3rd. And uh, notice the change. This will be in the Great Hall at the historic City Hall. This is to accommodate the recognition of graduating National Honor Society students. May 17th, we'll be back here, as well as June 14th at 6.30 in Coddington. Upcoming subcommittee meetings, April 26th, uh, beginning at 6 o'clock, 
at Coddington, quarterly uh, budget and finance, followed by teaching and learning and policy. Uh, reports of subcommittees, facilities, security, tr and transportation subcommittee, Mr. Gattro to report on the March 29th meeting. Mr. Gattro. Mr. Sandro, can you move to the other one, the other subcommittee? Paper okay, we'll go to uh, item B, teaching and learning subcommittee, Mrs. Lebo to report on the 29th meeting. Mrs. Lebo. Thank you, Mr. Sandro. Yes, we met at the teaching and learning subcommittee meeting that on the 29th, and we had three items on our agenda. The first was the partnership with the Museum of Science, which we heard a little bit about from the superintendent this, this evening, and that it includes PD and uh, curriculum units for grades three through five, and will be in place next year, and it's aligned with um, the mass frame, frameworks. The second item was the state seal of biliteracy, which is, it was an incredible presentation by Heather Wojak. Um, this is a new thing that's, that school districts can offer for students who are biliteral, biliteral? That's the word, I guess who have biliteracy. Uh, and we were expecting that maybe 10 of our students would be able to take this test. And it turns out that 82 students have signed up to take the test on April 10th in 16 different languages. And three students are testing in two languages. So not only will they have passed their ELA um, MCAS with a significant score, but they would have to score on these uh, language assessment tests to get a seal of biliteracy. So it's really an incredible thing. And the last thing we heard about was from um, Academic Programs Director Larry Taglieri. He reviewed the partnership with the Quincy Arts Association, and it includes a lot of support for uh, Quincy school-based art shows with the financial support of Deanna and Jessica Meyer, who have been working with us and with our schools for a while. And they'll be working on murals to take place during Quincy 400 and also to celebrate Quincy Gallery in the fall. Of their, their work will be at the Quincy Gallery in the fall of 2023. And these minutes are on the website. The policy subcommittee meeting uh, met on uh, March 29th, and uh, we reviewed uh, a revised version of the proposed 2023-24 Quinty Public Schools year calendar. Uh, Ms. Owens noted this version was redesigned to incorporate information about major religious and cultural holidays that staff would be encouraged to avoid when scheduling project due dates, assessments, field trips, athletics, and other activities. Ms. Owens suggested adding Kwanzaa, even though it typically falls during the December vacation week. Mr. Santoro will not vote in favor of this proposed calendar since Lunar New Year is not being recognized as a no school day. He requested that someone make a motion at the full, full school committee meeting to recognize uh, Monday, February 12, 2024, as a no school day. Mr. Castro made a motion to move the 2023-2024 school year calendar as amended to include Bonds into the full school committee. Ms. Hubley second the motion. Um, Ms. McGall then introduced the revision of school committee policy book, section 5.2.3, emergency closings. The suggested edits are being uh, are to bring the written policy in line with current practice. Um, a motion by Mr. Guttrow uh, and Ms. Hubley seconded. Uh, and um, these uh, full. Um, Minutes are online. Thank you, Mr. Pagoli. Mr. Gutro, Facilities and Security and Transportation Subcommittee. On the March 29th, we also had a Facilities, Security, Transportation Subcommittee meeting. The highlight was Mr. Hines, Commissioner Hines, the head of public buildings. There were three items on the agenda. The first was an update on the De Cristofaro Learning Center, at which uh, he shared architect's renderings of the building exterior, parking, playground, safety enhancements, and so forth. He also shared interior photos. Um, second item that he talked about was an update on projects and process around the Massachusetts School Building Authority for the Accelerated Repair Program, the city having three projects, Montclair, for a partial roof replacement and possible parapet and wall repointing, Wallison School for a partial roof replacement, both anticipated in the summer of 2024. Parker also will receive a new boiler room, all fixtures, components by the summer of 2025, and MSB assigned uh, the owner's project manager. Uh, also, MSBA core project for the Squatum Elementary School. Um, they announced the uh, OPM for the site and 
the designer selection process is underway. There were three strong responses for the RFP. Um, and the uh, vice chair, the superintendent, and Commissioner Hines will review the submissions, um, I believe, this week. And uh, Commissioner Hines also reviewed with the uh, subcommittee the facilities needs that were included in the school improvement plans that we all looked at many months ago. Um, to, to long story short, he indicated that all of the requests that were in the school improvement plans for capital projects will be included in his submission for the capital improvement plan, which will go before the city council for a vote. This too will be posted on the uh, School Committee website, if anybody wants to read the detailed minutes. Thank you. On a motion of Mrs. Cahill, seconded by Mr. Gutro, we adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And the ayes have it. Thanks, everybody.